Welcome to the session uh, that I'm chairing. My name is Dr. George Liu. We have Dr. Brett Petzer, and then we have Anastasia from the uh, city of Powell River. Right, so I got a bit of a story before we start about what, what is this connection between the Netherlands and Canada, and why is uh, my colleague from uh, the Netherlands, South, South Africa, uh, here to come to you, talk to you about Canadian cycling. So I uh, was born in Beijing. I immigrated to Toronto, Canada, and then I got really interested in cycling, right? And the form of cycling I got interested while I was in Canada was the form of cycling on the right, on your right, which is mountain biking. And as you know, uh, Vancouver, Vancouver Island, this whole area has the best mountain biking in the world. And some people call Whistler the top mountain biking destination of the world, right? So that's recreational cycling for you. On the left is a picture of me in, what do you have? Windmills, dikes, and bikes, right? That is uh, quintessential Dutch. So in 2016, I received the opportunity to work on this project called Smart Cycling Futures. And uh, together with Brett, we were able to spend four years in the Netherlands doing living, eating, uh, sleeping, cycling research and learning all about Dutch cycling infrastructure, right? And, uh, and it, was, it was there where me and Brett met. And I also have a special connection with the Sunshine Coast and Powell River because Powell River uh, is a small town, uh, you're familiar. I lived in Duncan on Vancouver Island for a while, but you know, the Sunshine Coast is kind of like an island, right? With only ferry service. And I also enjoy the mountain bike trails in Powell River. It's a logging community, more of a blue collar environment, a smaller city. Um, and I think smaller cities like this has a lot to learn uh, from other smaller cities, whether it's in Europe or other places in North America. And today I wanna to make the connection between recreation cycling on the one hand and urban cycling on the other hand. So how, are, is there a cross between the two? Is there, can we change people from the pickup drivers with their mountain bikes in the back, driving to the trailhead, you know, can you, we use these mountain bikes for day-to-day -day shopping or, or tow our kids behind it, right? So let's, let's think of that as the theme of today's panel. Uh, I also uh, produce videos on YouTube. So if you want to learn, learn about European urban planning, if you want to learn about uh, Dutch cycling, you know, YouTube is where you can find me and you can also add me on LinkedIn. Uh, Brett is very active on social media as well. So uh, after this discussion, if you want to connect with us, he's big on Twitter and I'm big on LinkedIn and we can uh, continue the conversation that way. Okay, but this is me in Utrecht with a bike path on top of a school, right? And Utrecht is the fourth largest city in the Netherlands, um, but the footprint, you know, is not that much bigger than Powell River, even though in Europe and these dense cities you can cram a lot more people in there, right? So how do we make small, cities. Um, and this is one of my videos to preview kind of what I do on the internet because I love urbanism more or as much as I love mountain biking, right? Um, so to get started, I want to uh, also have Anastasia and Brett share with you their connection and how they got into cycling because all of us in this crowd, we've had this uh, inkling of inspiration at some point in our lives that caused us to come into cycling, right? It's not popular like being a fireman or, or being a police officer, one of the childhood dreams, but being an urban planner or someone who advocates for cycling infrastructure, that's something quite different. And that's something usually that we develop later in life, but think back to your childhood, right? Like I grew up on the back of my grandparents' uh, bicycle, right, in Beijing, China. And that was like, I was five years old. And here I am talking about cycling, you know, 30 years later. So uh, I'm going to give the floor to our uh, panelists uh, with your respective background stories. I'll start with you, Anastasia. Uh, what brought you to Powell River? And uh, you know, let us know what got you into cycling. Yeah, well, um, I grew up in Russia, and I moved to Canada in my early 20s. And growing up, my family didn't own a car. None of my friends' families owned a car. It was completely normal uh, to get around exclusively by transit and by walking. And I actually only got my license just a few years ago when I moved to Powell River because it's the first place I lived where I felt it was necessary for me to drive. Um, otherwise, it was just too limiting in terms of what I'd be able to do. 
and I still haven't come to embrace it. You know, I won't, I hesitate to drive on the highway, I won't drive in the big city. You know, we talk here a lot about people not being comfortable biking and walking. Some people aren't comfortable driving, it's a thing. And, you know, my situation is not unique. I meet a lot of women who moved either from countries where they grew up in no car or uh, urban areas in Canada where they didn't drive and then they moved to Powell River and they're still and hesitant, you know, they avoid the highway, they will not drive in the big city. And now I have a one-year-old, so I still kind of choose activities based on where I can bike, where I can walk, and I find he's a lot happier in my bike trailer than strapped into his rear-facing car seat. Uh, so that's my connection to cycling and walking. And professionally, my background is in math. I worked in carbon accounting in Vancouver, and when I moved to Powell River, the focus was on greenhouse gas emission reduction, but that so quickly became all about transportation because 70% of emissions and power of race transportation. So I guess that allowed me to combine my passion for cycling and my work. Yeah. We're talking about cycling, but what we're really here for is mind shift, right? So green greenhouse gas emissions eventually got you into like, wait, why don't we do cycling? You know, that could contribute. So it's really a lens to see things. Thanks for sharing. And uh, next we are going to Brett, Dr. Brett Hetzer. <laughs> And you have an uh, amazing story, so strap in. <laughs> oh, oh, Christ, thanks. Um, <laughs> well, George was telling you about how we all actually got radicalized in the Netherlands, um, which is uh, an ongoing secret project of the Dutch government to bring, <laughs> bring people in. I, I see this uh, every day at work. The, we have Dutch experts at Mobicon, a consultancy where I now work, and these people make uh, bike infrastructure that is uh, at an incredibly high level of uh, regional, national, direct, just uh, dream infrastructure, but they, it gets built. Um, but for the Dutch, this is normal. They, might, they could have been tram engineers or they could be doing many other things. For the international team at work, this is ideology. We, 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 we came here we were drawn here, nothing was accidental. I think every single one of us here will have that, that conversion story, that moment when you realize this, this humble piece of technology that has been stable since 1885 um, is radical and uh, it, it asks something of us that is radical. And if we, if we, are, if we give it what it needs, it can bring about a kind of urbanism that is, has always been there, but is easy to miss. We, we think of the way our cities are as normal and that our culture has given us this, where it's actually cities have shaped us. But anyway, I was realizing this when I was growing up in South Africa. Uh, my mom was a single parent and, uh, well, she was busy. And I cycled around by myself I just didn't know, but I didn't understand why no one else did it. And uh, in Cape Town, I got really radicalized when I was just, my parents were tired of paying for my endless studying. So I worked as a junior architect, couldn't afford a car, cycled around Cape Town all by myself for, for years and years. Also professionally, uh, to get to work and appointments, uh, that was uh, not a thing that was common. Uh, although there are a lot of, there is a long culture of black working class cycling. As I was a white middle class person cycling around, I, I just couldn't understand why that wasn't also common. Anyway, I'm making it a bit long, but I came to the Netherlands. We met. I have a lot of interest in the change that's possible in small cities. And um, that's where we do a lot of our work. So and this sorry. is your first day in North America ever. ever. Yes. <laughs> so welcome and car it's, shock. It's, car it's, shock. Yeah. <laughs> welcome to our conference. All right, uh, Brett, Brett, so you're, you're going to lead the audience, audience now through a brief exercise. exercise. More oh, yeah. on the, the why here. Oh, sorry, yes. I got your three questions oh, here. Thank right. you. Um, this is going to, I'm going to try and do this in two seconds. Um, I want to ask, uh, firstly, I, there were these questions about childhood habitat and I've actually thought just while we were sitting of a way to maybe streamline it I want to say when you were 13 or 12 or 13 in your lives um, how far were you allowed to roam without asking any permission from your parents what was your habitat as children 
Uh, can we, do we have anybody who had a habitat up to, say, the end of the street? Let's call it 50 meters. Further than that, 100 meters. Um, any of you allowed to roam one or two kilometers more? Yeah? You had, okay, this is amazing. You had 15 miles. <laughs> well, I, when I do this exercise in a lot of countries, there's a kind of predictable curve where I was born in 1986. I was allowed to, the whole town was mine. If my mother would only too happy to have me uh, go out and come back when the street lights came on. Um, I think that for many of us in our families, maybe people in my generation had that. Our grandparents had more. My friends who have young children have very, very small habitats indeed. Uh, they can go to the end of the street. And our cities have not changed that much in a generation. Cars have changed that much in a generation. They're changing now year by year, heavier, faster, higher off the ground, less vision. Um, so I think that that Powell River and the small cities of this world are maybe a kind of way to unlock big habitats for children. Uh, it might even be easier there than in some cities, big cities. But I think that's the goal, is to raise a generation of children who think of community and urbanity as something they're allowed to have and something that's normal and that they would miss if they didn't have it. I would miss it if I had the habitat of a young child now. I can't imagine my life not allowed to go past the end of the cul-de-sac or the road. Uh, everything would be different, my, my richest experiences. So just keeping that in mind for today, I think that's, we, we, we owe that to the next generation a little bit. Good. Um, and then uh, for Anastasia events, on that note, uh, I have a slide up of, uh, this is Powell River, right? If we can yes, confirm, yes. Okay, so that's Powell River. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would like you, now that the academics are done talking with our abstract uh, <laughs> <laughs> nonsense, uh, maybe you can bring us to something a bit more concrete about uh, your city, Powell yes. River. Happy to do that. So this is a screenshot of our city. We are, just to give you a brief intro, we are a small city, about 14,000 residents stretched along 10 or so kilometers of the coast. Um, in just three years ago, we adopted our first all ages and abilities cycling network plan. We worked with Copenhagen Ice Design Company on developing it. Um, in orange there, you see the cycling network. That's a combination of neighborhood bikeways, protected bike lanes, off street paths, about 50 kilometers of it. And it's been adopted into our official community plan to further um, show how committed our council is to implementing the plan. And I think it's, it's a fantastic plan. It was super practical. It looked at all the destinations, you know, schools, shopping, services, where do people need to go, and laid out a network that connects people to those destinations, not just in a safe way, but in a very direct way. And I think that directness is so important. If we're looking to get that mode share, we cannot be telling people to go you know, two blocks over to the left, take the residential street, and come back. Because I know some communities do that, too, because they're afraid to tackle those main corridors and you know, take some space away from water vehicles. Our plan doesn't do that. If the direct route is the main arterial, that's where the protected bike lanes go. So I'm quite excited about the plan. Um, we, we are seeing a lot more people on bikes. You know, we're super hilly, but the e-bikes have basically flattened Powell River, is how we like to say. We see lots of um, seniors on bikes, um, but still that lack of infrastructure is what we hear over and over and again in our engagement sessions is either pre prevents people from getting out on bike for more trips or getting on a bike in the first place. It's just they don't feel safe on the streets. So building that network is what we need to do to get the mode share shift that we need. Yeah. Cool. And looking at this map, this question is for you, Brent. Um, you see any similarities here between this community and remote? Uh, it's not quite remote, BC, right? But, uh, you know, remote enough from Metro Vancouver to, uh, you mentioned Delft is where the headquarters of Mobicon, where you work, is. Mm -hmm. um, you see any immediate, like, crossovers or things you can... Um, relate to in your eight hours here so far? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think 
uh, we're talking about infrastructure, but we mean to give the people of Powell River a certain kind of a life, a, a, a big life, uh, that, that people who legally can't drive, children, and people who, who don't want to have to drive, who don't want to pay that much of their income to driving, all of those, that big, big, big uh, part of the population, give them a town that they can access, enjoy, sit around at a cafe, shop, give them a full life, uh, or rather stop, not, not have it taken away by car dependence. Um, I mean, the urban form is, Delft does have a, long, a lot of long straight canals, but uh, I, think, I think maybe the similarities here are really that a community starting to define or on the way to defining a demand, and the demand is for uh, a big inclusive life for every person in the community, not just the people who are over 16, have passed the test, have the disposable income, that's, and, and, and uh, everyone dependent on that part of the population. Um, so I think that that's the radicalism that made Delft in the 70s hit the Netherlands like a, um, a, a short, sharp shock. Um, the Netherlands had the energy crisis, it had no car manufacturing industry, the car lobby was not as strong as in other countries. Denmark and the Netherlands kind of narrowly succeeded in that demand being made, that radical demand now looking inevitable. But I think the difference, what we sometimes forget and what Peter Norton, a wonderful historian that we both know that came to the Netherlands and is in dialogue with Dutch cycling history, he proved that that demand, parents getting out front and saying, no more, not one child more killed at this intersection, ever. That demand was made all across the US, all across Canada. It is in history, it has perhaps been forgotten or overlooked, but it was, it, people have never stopped asking, and now we can, it's the next juncture where people in your city have said, We're at, we, we are shifting course, we're going down this route in history, and one day this will look inevitable, you know, um, and that's the hope. And Peter Norton's book is uh, Fighting Traffic. It was about uh, you know, how motor vehicles in the U.S. and law and the, uh, the, the fight for street space, essentially, in the 1920s and 30s. So if you are interested, it's a great read for uh, anyone in this audience. Um, next, I wanted to move to challenges. And, uh, and we, we want to deep dive a bit more into the practicalities of how things get done here in, in BC, okay? And this includes funding, this includes all the frustrations that you may come across <laughs> in your daily Buckle work. Buckle up, everyone. <laughs> uh, so the, the question is, uh, what is uh, the biggest challenge in Powell River? Um, yes, so challenges. Funding is a huge challenge. So our network plan is about 50 kilometers of cycling infrastructure, different types of it. Um, I was just doing some rough math before the sessions we started. So we adopted the plan three years ago. We've been applying for all the grants on the table, federal and provincial, and we've actually been getting all the grants we applied for. And still, we're building it at about roughly one kilometer per year. So the simple math will tell you that it will take us uh, half a century to have that network in place. And the challenge with that is not just the delay in having patience, but the challenge with that is that's many, many council terms. Right? So what kind of commitment do you need from different councils to believe in the vision to say, we know when we have that complete network in place, we are going to say, you know, have 20% cycling culture in this community. Not impossible, but as you can see, it's very challenging. Right? So that's a, that's a huge challenge for us. How many yeah. traffic engineers in this room? Show hands. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm moving to a technical university, so I'll be one of them soon enough. Um, 10 or 12, okay. So, um, <laughs> Anastasia, you, you wanted us to talk about level of service, eh? I'm afraid. Um, so, uh, the, 
the, the prompt here is, uh, what, what is the issue with traditional traffic service, uh, tra traditional traffic studies and this concept of level of service? Yes, um, level of service. So as you can see, Paul River is a small town. You know, we don't really have congestion. We have a peak hour, it's when the school pickup happens. And on the main arterial, you will have a bit of a lineup at the intersection. That's about the extent of our traffic problems. Despite that, um, we still do traffic studies that cost tens of thousands of dollars to complete. And we have engineers going out there to our main intersections at our peak hour, counting the cars turning left, counting the cars going through, counting the cars turning straight. And then our council gets this very serious engineering report that they paid a lot of money for that has level of service tables. So for those who are not familiar, level of service typically at the intersection is the waiting time uh, for how long are vehicles waiting on average to make those moves to turn left, to go through, and it's A, B, C, D, E, F, et cetera, and it's in 10 second increments. So if you're waiting 10 seconds or less, we have free flow, level of service A. If you're waiting 20 seconds, B, 30, C, et cetera. It seems pretty arbitrary, because I think it is arbitrary. And it's something that someone came up with in 1962 and we just never thought to change it. You know, but we continue to do those traffic studies. And as a council member, you know, they're not urban planners, they're not engineers, they don't know the history of this metric. They're looking at an engineering report that has level of services C in red for left turn. It looks like a bridge is going to collapse. Right? We have a technical problem here. Right? So uh, what kind of council member does it take to overwrite that? Right? You can imagine that. So I think those reports are extremely misleading. They are biased very heavily. There's no level of service there for any other mode of transport. Right? As if that doesn't matter. And I think this just, yeah, we need to stop that practice. I'm sure it's not just holding Powell River back. It's holding many other communities back. So. You work in practice, Brett, in the Netherlands with Mobicon. Uh, and I'm aware Mobicon has a few projects in North America as well. So uh, from your perspective, have you interacted with this concept of level of service? And does it permeate even to Bike Utopia? <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, I just want to say and that's one of the most beautiful descriptions I've ever heard of this. Um, there's a book called uh, Killed by a Traffic Engineer, which is, which is out recently. Um, and it's sort of, you've, you've, you've encapsulated it. It sounds and seems, by design, objective, inarguable. It's simply serious. Everything else is unserious. It happens automatically. Everything else is... Um, it, Get, have a meeting for the volunteers, hold a bake sale to raise funds for the signs, pickets. Uh, everything else runs on this vast, um, free or unpaid resource of volunteer time. Now, when now Mobicon has an Ottawa office and other offices around North America um, and is doing more and more work in, in Canada especially, um, and what we come up against is I think almost an Anne Hidalgo moment, the mayor of Paris, a woman who I think has become changed everything forever by being willing, by being elected mayor of Paris and saying, as the mayor, I am willing to say that the political system I'm at the head of cannot deliver cycling and walking infrastructure. We say we can, we think we can, we can't. The proof is the last 20 years. We will not meet our targets and we will not meet our, the political contract we have with our citizens. So we have failed and I will not try the same thing again. And she did a lot of things that were at best illegal at the moment that she did them, did them and simultaneously fought it in the courts. So <laughs> rather apologize, rather, rather apologize. Well, she didn't even apologize, she didn't have to, she was re-elected. But, um, <laughs> It's exactly that moment that what you describe of uh, um, when you, the constraints of the system are, they make it impossible for us to move forward. And what I think Mobicon's lesson has been is that with, with, when there is a little germ of frustration, a little inkling in a town, that this system isn't really for us. It came from somewhere 
we don't know. You can follow this historically where it came from, but it was never really made for us. It, it, it can't give us what we want. It, it can't make us better. It, it's actively stopping that. Uh, then there is, that's all the resource you need for that town in a single political term to start shifting. And I think the details of how Mo becomes, I think, being active in, in cities like Canmore in British Columbia, which is, I think, not much large, not too different in size from Powell River. Um, and the window needs to shift in the town. And then I think I have been consistently shocked by how much is possible in local politics when you start to push and you find that there are no guardrails, actually there is perhaps more freedom than is imagined to move around level of service. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that's a hope. <laughs> You're very hopeful, giving us some hope. I'm very hopeful. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, so let's talk about funding. That could be our next conversation. We've from level of service to funding and navigating uh, the bureaucracy, the politics of uh, many levels of, uh, of government and trying to figure out how to piece these puzzles together so that these funding goes to projects that make sense both on a local level as well as on a regional connectivity level, right? So uh, Anastasia, you've had a lot of struggles with getting the funding together um, at your level of government. What kind of struggles have you had and how would you see things, uh, how would you wish things are done differently in the future? Yes, um, I mean, currently we're applying for all the funding we can, we're putting these pieces together one at a time, but as I described, the huge challenge with that is that when you upgrade one intersection or you know, two kilometers of road over here, you don't wake up the next morning and see these Paris-like videos of cyclists you know, lining up at the intersection. You need the complete network or most of your network built to see that, right? So it takes that belief from the politicians that if they keep doing that over decades, that they will see that kind of change, right? And I think that's a lot to ask from any small community to do. It's not impossible, but I think it's very unlikely. So what I would love to see is, as Delft did in the 80s, right? When the national government of the Netherlands said, let's put in a complete skeleton of a network, let's track, let's put the trackers in, see what is the mode share shift that we see, see what's possible, and then replicate that in other communities. Imagine if our provincial government had a complete network grant, you know, 30, 40 million dollars, sounds like a lot until you compare it to major highway projects and then it's a rounding error, <laughs> right? And take a small town where it doesn't take billions to put in a complete network, the most of the complete network over years and not decades. And we have the technology, you know, automatic cycling trackers see exactly what happens. And I really do believe based on all the engagements we do that we can have 20% or higher cycling mode share if that network is in place. And imagine if we had that example here in BC that other communities in North America could look at and say, yes, it's possible. We know that if we borrow the money you know, and we build it, they will come. And we're no longer looking at videos of Paris you know, for inspiration, but it's something in North America. So I'd love to see that. If any, any folks from provincial government, come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and Brett, you've been saying to me, you know, politicians, they, they respond to what the people want, right? And, and that's what you, your message here for us is today, is why you're telling us these idealistic kind of visions of where things could end up. Um, and, you know, once this vision exists, right, like once you encourage a community to have this vision, uh, once they buy into these ideas, like, oh, sure, our kids should have safe routes to school, uh, these self-evident aspects that it would be hard pressed for any politician to disagree with. Uh, what is the, the, the next step? So you have a politician, you have a politician with support, let's imagine this world, um, and, uh, and the funding is there, right? It, and, the Netherlands and the Dutch experience that we're only gotten here after years of struggle. But all, if all the pieces were there, you know, what, 
what does it take to get everything together? What does it take to actually take the action to build the physical infrastructure? Oh, thank you, George. Um, well, I think, I think when, when I was listening to you both, and um, again, it, and it's been, um, I really understand this frustration. It's a thing that we have seen over and over again. Uh, Mobicon is mostly working with, in the international team and the North American team with non-Dutch cities that want something of that Dutch vision. Um, and it made me think not of Delft, but actually of Groningen, a hard to pronounce city in the north of the Netherlands, a student town. In the 70s, they had their big bang moment with, when the city was poor, with radical student activists and, and, and Greens and leftists who got onto the council and realized a thing that I think is still true everywhere is every city in the world has a cycling and walking network, but cars are on it. Hmm. <laughs> and if cars would give back one street out of five parallel roads, or be, if motorists would be made to lose that as only a direct route, uh, then you could have a cycling network in 48 hours with some cones. Um, in, I think it was in, uh, in Colorado, um, where at Fort Collins, where Mobicon, we were active there and kept getting challenged by certain local leaders who said, no one could understand a Dutch protected intersection. And with help from the mayor, I think it was, um, Mobicon got permission to work with local people and just in a Walmart parking lot, build a life-size mock-up of this protected intersection with cones and chalk and have the city's fire trucks drive around it and school buses with children and prove in a weekend that that just wasn't true. Everybody gets it. It's, uh, yeah, we learn all the time. We're always confronted with new environments. We, we have to adapt, otherwise we couldn't leave our, our driveway. Um, and so, sorry, that goes back to changing the game. But when, just to bring it back to your question of um, how to do it, assuming there is funding, I think, I think it's, I think it's tactical. Tactical. Okay. Uh, tactical changes the political conversation, and then the engineering solutions are simple. They already exist. They've existed for many years, but it's that political courage to disprove a belief that is otherwise allowed to persist, that um, this just isn't us. Um, we'll need to add on a cycling network on top of a cohesive um, car network that already goes everywhere. You can't ever do that. No city I'm aware of has ever managed it. It would be an impossible challenge, and that's why it doesn't succeed. Yeah. Are there burning questions from the audience? Oh, okay, there are. All right, so uh, hold your questions. I'm just mindful of time. So we're going to wrap up our discussion up here, uh, some final thoughts, and then we will go to the audience because there is a few questions. Is that okay with you? Okay. Um, so uh, we talked about uh, the, the Power River. You got a brief description. We talked about uh, the Netherlands. Um, and I was wondering for, for both you, Brett, and then also Anastasia, you know, what, what would be a key message that you want to leave with the audience uh, based on this discussion? I'll start with uh, Anastasia. I think people are interested in getting around on bikes and walking. You know, we don't have the oil embargo of the 70s, but gas is 260 in Paul River, last time I looked. We have an affordability crisis in the province. The conditions are right. If we put in the safe infrastructure, we know we will see those impressive mode shares. Mm -hmm. So we need to make this happen in the community and show what's possible. Let's do it. <laughs> and uh, Brett, based on your one day here in North America. <laughs> <laughs> Tips for us, please. <laughs> um, well, Cars are not the enemy, but car dependency is an enemy. Car enforced car dependency is a terrible thing, and we have to name it. 
um, it, it's not culture, it's not just how things are, it, it is a radical political decision that gets more radical by the year. Now cycling is the solution to a lot of things in a city like Powell River, it's it, it, health, uh, independence of children, the freedom of parents from having to be chauffeurs, um, freedom over time, uh, it, it, reconnection to nature, reconnection to wildness. Um, I think in, I, I'm on treading care, trying to tread carefully here, but maybe also in one sense reconciliation with traditional custodians of the land. Um, that conversation is far more advanced here, I think, than in South Africa, but whatever. Um, cycling is the answer to a lot of these, th these challenges. Car dependency is a driver and intensifier of these challenges. And there is, it is, its infrastructure is all around us, but it doesn't have to be. And I think, I just want to say, Anna, you are fighting the good fight in your city. <laughs> I, I, I think we ha it cannot take 50 years. You're doing everything possible. Uh, I don't have the answer, but maybe more, more alliances, more uh, we can talk. <laughs> but uh, we don't have 50 years. Um, and that's just, it's just not more complicated than that. We don't have 50 years. All right. Uh, I think we can fit in two questions from the audience. Andrea, I just wanted to uh, comment on Anastasia's challenge of taking 50 years to build a cycling network. You might want to look at some stuff that's going on in Ontario. Uh, the city of Toronto is actively taking transportation lanes away from cars and public transit and turning it over to dedicated cycling lanes. And that started in COVID when they closed Bayview Avenue, which is a major four-lane arterial road, and turned it over to cycling use. And transportation patterns have changed in bigger cities, certainly because people don't want to work in an office any longer. They're working at home. Uh, and the city of Ottawa is actually experimenting with closing roads on the weekend to demonstrate to naysayers in the political level that the demand for active transportation actually is there. So that's a non-threatening way. Go to your mayor and say, we want to close all of those roads that are in orange for one Sunday in the summer and see what happens. Pedestrian and active transportation only. It's not a very threatening ask. Thank you. And a question with a question mark, please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Emily and I'm with Mission Mission BC, but I also live in a small town in the Kootenays, which is Kimberley, so a little bit smaller than Powell River. And I'm an active transportation enthusiast and I'm a mom. And um, I would say two challenges that I observe in my small town, uh, BC, are hills like huge elevation difference between the town center and where people live. And I would say in the <coughs> children habitat, they're black bears, brown bears, cougars. I know in South Africa, they're probably tigers or lions. <laughs> so to me as a mother, you know, I, I love to expand my daughter's, you know, a habitat. She can bike to the swimming pool, for instance, it's all downhill, no problem. And if she doesn't encounter there, you know, which is a, a real concern for parents. And I see on your map you have quite a few of those um, sections that are in green space. So I'm assuming that's forest, right? So maybe that's a consideration. And then having a network that is um, following the topography, I think, is a challenge. So I don't know if you have any examples. So here's my question with a question mark. Do you have any examples of? towns that have a big elevation, like I'm talking like 400 meter vertical between the swimming pool and our place, right? So, um, so examples where the network has been really well developed around topography, that'd be great. I can comment on the topography piece. So topography was a huge consideration when we were developing the plan. We had all the topographic data and the routes were selected based on the slope. 
right? So ensuring that we're not sending people up the steep hills. The topography is still very much a reality, but we are able to connect our key destinations while still having a reasonable slope. And e-bikes are, I think, for that reason, are very popular in Powell River and just flatten the hills. We, as a society, are prepared to mortgage our whole futures to build things that make it easy for cars to get up and down slopes. Um, I think that m much is possible uh, in terms of e-bikes. I think, you know, the the cost effectiveness of, of rebates and, and subsidies for e-bikes is is incredible. Um, they're always oversubscribed these programs, and, and I hope to see much more of them. Um, I think we're at the very beginning of reflecting, especially because the Netherlands is flat, <laughs> um, of, on, on just how much is possible because everything we build for cycling, if we build it well, we also build for wheelchair users. The Netherlands is full of people on mobility scooters. If I could just, short reflection is when I was there early on and we were still, our job was to sit in a room and think of bikes, think about cycling all day. I was in a forest about five kilometers from the nearest road and I saw two older women um, in leopard print um, sort of shawls on two mobility scooters going through the forest together on a bike path. That meant that every point between their home and there had not only been a scooter built to someone on a mobility scooter, but um, there were alternatives there was a, one little construction project didn't take it away, there was choice, there was reliability, there was certainty. All of those things combined to the fact that they could enjoy that experience, their mental, the mental load of being there was so low that they were going in a mobility scooter into the middle of a forest for pleasure. And pleasure is part of life. If our mobility system can't give people that, then, then we've lost. Um, so ramps, uh, I, I know that these are big, big differences you're talking about, but I just also think that um, the, we're at the very beginning of imagining what is possible, that everything we build for cycling, we will, we, we will not build it twice if we build it well for wheelchair users, mobility scooters, and disabled people, and people who have trouble walking, which is all of us eventually. It's 100% of us eventually if we're blessed to, to live that long. You almost answered my question. Um, in BC, it's illegal to use a wheelchair or a mobility scooter on a bike and roll lane or a bike and roll route. Should we change that? I'm going to leave that on a hanging question, and that's something for the audience to ponder because <laughs> how convenient, we are out of time. So, uh, one big round of applause for Anastasia from Tower River. <laughs> Thank Dr. You. Brett Petzer, and thank you all to the audience for joining us on this session. Please enjoy your break. Take care.